I hope for the sake of your credibility this is a very one-sided vote, as Dumb and Dumber is one of my favorite comedies of all time. Now if you stepped onto this channel hoping for a fair fight today, you came to the wrong place. I'm gonna kick Dumb and Dumber 2's ass, sea bass. It seems like people either love or hate Jim Carrey. I fall into the former category, although he hasn't had a good comedic role since me, myself, and Irene. In Dumb and Dumber he plays Lloyd Christmas, like the tree, not the holiday. His wide-eyed cluelessness to basically everything around him was his charm. Getting mugged by a mean old lady on a motorized cart, smashing into a parked car, and running off the side of an airport terminal make for some great comedy. In the sequel, Carrie's character is an unlikable ass, a full-on character of his former self. He does know how to choke down a hot dog with style, I'll give him that much. Like Carrie, Jeff Daniels falls into cartoon territory more often than not, reprising his role as Harry Dunn. Gone is the ski lift licking, snowball wielding, dog grooming oaf from the first film, and in his place is a more, dare I say, boring version? Where the flick has our boys almost carelessly throwing out one-liners, it takes damn near an eternity to find a single joke to land in this sequel. I laughed out loud precisely one time in this follow-up film. That is unacceptable for a Dumb and Dumber movie. Let's talk supporting cast. Jim Carrey's second wife, Lauren Hawley, plays love interest Mary Swanson. She's a very normal, straightforward character, which is important in films like this. You need grounded people around the lunatics to make the jokes really land. Harry and Lloyd get a road trip companion around the halfway mark, played by Mike Starr. The character Joe Mantellino, better known as the Gas Man, plays the perfect straight-laced villain to bounce antics off of. This plot point, amongst many others, is regurgitated in the sequel to lesser effect. They are played by typically funny man Rob Riggle. He actually plays two separate parts, but they might as well be the same, since there's little here for him to do outside using camouflage jokes that are about as dated as the rest of the film. Harlan Williams as a state trooper is probably one of my favorite side characters in the original, along with the always welcome Seabass appearance. Braddy Blum crossed over to the new picture to get another dose of pet mutilation, but it's just another reminder that sometimes less is more. Kathleen Turner showed up to play old fling Frida Felcher. Quite frankly, she deserved better. Later in the film, we're finally introduced to Harry's estranged daughter. The only thing going for her is that she's easy on the eyes. There are two big cameos in Dumb and Dumber 2. Well, actually, there's, there's one. There were supposed to be two. Actually... There's not really one even, because you don't see his face or body, because he's covered in a hazmat suit. Okay, it's Bill Murray as Ice Pick, and he has one unfunny line in the film. Enjoy. The second was Jennifer Lawrence, who was supposed to be in the picture as a young Frida Felcher, and at the last minute backed out. That's just a rumor, though. Some others say that she just didn't have time to film her part and really wanted to. Either is very believable, as I saw the final product, and it was not up to stuff. When I heard they were resurrecting Dumb and Dumber for a sequel, I thought to myself, there's about a one in a million shot this is going to work. So I was telling myself there was a chance. I was wrong. The first Dumb and Dumber is a tale of two dimwits who happened upon a mysterious briefcase left behind by the girl of Lloyd's dreams. Unbeknownst to them, it's full of ransom money that was meant for a couple of kidnappers. This leads our boys on a cross-country romp to someplace warm. A place where the beer flowed like wine, and women instinctively flocked to men like the salmon of Capistrano. I'm talking about a little place called Aspen. The new installment takes almost identical beats, but is hampered down by extended gags that aren't particularly funny. It opens with a joke that plays out far too long. We meet Lloyd 20 years later in an almost vegetative state. This leads to the major plot of the film, which is Harry telling Lloyd he has a daughter and he wants to take her kidney. The script was written by six people. Six of them. And this is the best they could conjure up after 20 years. It's not a total failure, but for every one joke that lands well, 10 more fall harder than a dead parrot's head. For instance, there's a dream sequence in the first flick that was freaking hilarious, poking fun at multiple movie tropes, whilst adding its own flair of humor. The sequel doesn't get that at all, instead randomly throwing in ninjas and superhero costumes without the slightest idea of what to do with them. If you didn't gather by now, I didn't like it. I didn't like it a lot. There's a lot of great visual gags in the first flick, from the shag and wagon to the deployment of the airbag. Goodbye, my love! The Farley brothers over time have somehow forgotten how to frame up a shot and lead the viewers into a joke. Is this really the same crew that gave us something about Mary, Dumb and Dumber, and me, myself, and Irene? They do bring back the shag and wagon for one shot, the Mutt Cuts vehicle, but then they destroy it instantly. 
If that's not symbolism, I don't know what is, folks. Not one, but two Crash Test songs are represented in the 90s flick, and if that doesn't encapsulate everything about the 90s, I don't really know what does. Side note, I celebrate the Crash Test Dummies entire catalog, or CTD for short. Let's not forget the goofy trademark theme song, Boom Shaka Lock, that spills over into the sequel. In the first flick, it fits right in, jumping between both idiots working their jobs, but in two, it's just wedged in there while we sit on a fixed shot of our cartoons, trying their hardest to make an unfunny script work. Props to the Franz Ferdinand song as well in two. Big fan of those guys, and it's nice to hear them represented from time to time. Let's conclude this thing. Just when I thought the Farley brothers couldn't get any lower than movie 43, they do something like Dumb and Dumber 2, and totally redeem themselves. I demanded a proper follow-up, and not this low-level bullshit they gave us. We are talking about Dumb and Dumber here, folks. One of the most quotable movies of all time. Big gulps, huh? All right. See you later. Tic Tac, sir. Nice set of hooters you got there. It's okay. I'm a limo driver. Excuse me, Flo? What's the soup du jour? It's the soup of the day. Mmm, that sounds good. I'll have that. I am stressing way too much now. If you'd like to hear more positive things about Jim Carrey, head on over to Jonathan Paula's awesome channel and watch me converse with him about five different Jim Carrey flicks. But before you do that, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to Feud Nation if you haven't already, because I'm one pathetic loser. And every subscription means a lot to me. It props me up. It makes me feel good about myself. More than just reviews, this is Movie Feuds. Hey, you want to hear the third most annoying song in the world?